how do we wake in our dreams? One of the things you can do in dreaming is you can move fluently. You notice with your eyes wide open all the symbols and signs that are pulsing around you in ordinary life. The world around you is alive and it's dreaming and it's trying to speak to you. The world is dreaming with you. The world is dreaming around you. You're magnetic. If you start seeing things differently, if you start noticing, for example, that the world is speaking to you through that living symbol, that moment of awakening, that moment of observation, that moment of reckoning brings different things onto the path of manifestation. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to wake up in your dreams or explore the dream world and turn it into reality, then do we have the Big Dream Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Robert Moss, one of the first guests I ever had on the show and my all-time favorite dream traveler about one of the most phenomenal, important, profound, and fun books I've ever read, Growing Big Dreams. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about lucid dreaming, traveling in our dreams, playing in our dreams, and making our dreams a reality. That plus we'll talk about punching holes in the world, Tinkerbell and Peter Pan, heating calls while working on Wall Street, what on earth is an ondenonk, if I'm pronouncing that even close to the correct way, and what in the world yellow chicks and bull and the barbican has to do with anything. Gotcha. So welcome back to the show, Robert. Are you ready to shine? Oh, I love the smorgasbord you set up. I can't wait to graze and nosh on it. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. Well, before we dive right into things, Robert, the most important thing people want to know is, can we learn to fly in our dreams and fly wherever we'd like? You're born to fly, and in your dreams you remember. I mean, that's what it's about. The soul, if, or consciousness, if you like, has wings, or with or without, with, with or without wings, because you can fly Superman style in your dreams, of course. Some people do that. You can feel that you're swimming or biking through the air. Some people do that. Or you can spread your wings like a bird, and you might find that you're taking the form of a bird. And this is probably going on some night of your week, whether you know it or not. So learning in this sense is really about remembering and waking up to possibilities that already belong to you. This is part of your inheritance. You know, you're not just a 3D person. You're going to get around on your feet or in a car or on a bike in ordinary reality. In the larger reality, you are born to fly. That's who you are. So, so yes, not only can you learn to fly, but you can wake up to the fact that you have that power already. Woohoo! And I hope we can go there today, which begets the question, what's an Imagineer? Well, Imagineer is someone who can actually build from the imagination, from the subtle substance of, of the larger reality. The Imagineers can co-create the life that they're living down here. Imagineers, of course, it's a Disney word, but that doesn't mean it's confined to the Disney studios. They just popularized it and claimed it. An Imagineer can also participate in building environments in the larger reality, in what we can call the imaginal realm, which means the realm of true imagination. You know, this is where there are palaces, temples, pleasure parks, schools, places of healing, where shamans, mystics, and creators have always wanted to go to. And some of these places have existed longer by far than the Louvre or the Eiffel Tower or even the pyramids. You can learn to go there and you can actually learn to participate in setting up environments where you can do wonderful things. By the way, these environments are not remote to where you're going to live after death. So this is rather relevant to concerns like, what happens to me when I drop this sack of beaten bones and go on somewhere else? Where am I going to live? Am I going to have decent accommodation? Am I going to have a decent social life? Am I going to learn something new? So all of this, uh, all of these are examples of what it is when you become an Imagineer and learn the practice of imagination, which is one of the ways of manifesting in this world and also in other worlds. I am going to drop quite the, I don't know what, there's got to be a positive word other than bomb, but I'm going to drop quite the bomb in a minute that I've never shared on this show before, but the time has come. But before I do that, am I understanding right that if you build, as Thoreau says, your castles in the sky and you spend time in those castles, after we cross over to the other side, we may have the continuity and ability to still go and play in those castles? 
Absolutely. I mean, where do you think you're going to go in life or, or life beyond this life? I was once flying on an airplane with a copy of my book, Dream Games. I've written many, many books about these things. And a matriarch, you know, a patrician matriarch from the Boston area who's now living out in California arrives with about 12 members of extended family around her and sits down next to me and looks at my book and says, that looks interesting. May I have a look? So I hand the book to her. She opens it at random. She's in a section that says, design your own home in the afterlife. And she starts reading about the practical steps by which you can use your imagination, thorough style if you like, to create a comfortable environment where you might live when you've moved on from this world. She looks at me, her mouth open, bright and interested. She says, my God, I spent 20 years creating a jewel-like house in Carmel, California. I better get on with creating a, a, a no less attractive home for where I'm going to be going fairly soon. So she bought the book, of course. But the principle is true. And once you learn to become a frequent flyer, a traveler in these realms, because, Michael, one of the things you can do in dreaming is you can move fluently to realms where the dead are alive. And you can learn what the afterlife might contain for those you care about and for you yourself firsthand. And this is too interesting to rely on hand-me-down information. We need, in, we need firsthand knowledge about these things. And dreaming, as I teach and practice, is one of the ways to do that. Thank you. And we're, we're going to dive into how we can do this in a few minutes, and we're going to do an exercise at the very end where you can help people in this process. You can also, though, play in the imaginal realm and bring things back. And so this is kind of the, 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 the there's got to be a more positive word than bomb to describe something large and, and interesting. I'm, I'm a lover, not a fighter here, Robert. Um, I'm getting ready to dive down into my shelter. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, my wife and I, we've had over the years together three miscarriages. And um, I don't even know where to go with the understanding, the learnings, the everything. This past year, I started practicing, among other techniques, in the imaginal realm, calling our girls in calling in two beautiful girls. I said, beautiful, identical twins. We called them in in the imaginal realm. I set the intention each night before I went to sleep. We're, we're, we're that couple that would actually walk around privately. Nobody knew, but in a carriage, which had our, our, our kitty cat in it, but there were also two twin identical dolls in there, girls. And um, we got the amazing news a few months back that we're pregnant again. And by the time this airs, we're through that, uh, that window. We're well beyond where the miscarriages happen. We were told first, several months ago, we were pregnant. And then we were told a month ago that it was twins. And then we were told that it's identical twins. And we know that we called them in by playing in the imaginal realm. Or... Maybe the imaginal realm, they were already there waiting for us and called us in. It's very moving, Michael, and I wish that your, all, the paths of all of you may be open. I, I speak to the gatekeeper every day. The gatekeeper is personified by Ganesha, who's here on my right side and by many other beings. One of my main, main forms of asking for help and guidance every day is to ask that my gate doors and gates and paths should be open. So I ask the same thing for you and your family. But I'm also reminded as I listen to you, and it's so moving, of what an Aboriginal elder in my native Australia once said to me. He said, you know, Robert, uh, the spirits of those who are going to be born, ready to be born, are waiting in the water holes. They're waiting in bodies of fresh water, waiting for the right parents and waiting to come through. And when they're ready to come through, they all need a spiritual parent who may or may not be one of the physical parents to guide the soul, to reassure it, to call it in, and to make it clear to the soul that it's going to have a good life, that it's going to be welcome in this world. If that is missing, things tend to go wrong, not, not, ju not just in terms of uh, some problems with the birth process, but in problems with the satisfaction, of the, 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 the taking up of re residence of the incoming spirit in the world. So it seems as if you yourself, perhaps with your wife as well, are playing the role of spiritual as well as physical presence for the children, which is absolutely fundamental. So I hope that it all goes well. Thank you. I would say certainly there have been a lot of ducks over the years that we've gotten in a row 
to make them as comfortable as possible because you are bringing in spiritual elders. We are all bringing in elders. We just have to give them the opportunity to be the elders that they are. And we need to be able to give them that space. Going back to space here for a second. Since this won't be the whole baby show. We'll save that for another time. But, but thank you for letting me share because we've been playing in the imaginal realm. But let's talk about Ganesh. Let's talk about the gatekeeper. And would you mind sharing the invocation you make to the gatekeeper either each day or each time you enter the dream world? All right, but let's adapt it to where we are in this particular sharing because we're going to go deep. We're actually not only in conversation, we're going to do a small exercise of taking people to a place of dreams and imagination. So let me say this, Michael, as we journey together on the roads of soul and learn what dreaming can be and find places of sanctuary in the imaginal realm, may our doors and gates and paths be open and our doors and gates and paths between the worlds, and may the doors and gates and paths of any who wish to do us or those we love any harm be closed. May it be so. Uh, it's very effective, practical uh, action, really. That these words are actions to set up good boundaries, to speak nicely, to that power in life that opens and closes doors, who's personified as Ganesha, the beloved elephant-headed god of India. My version of Ganesha, which is a reproduction of a, of a very ancient bronze, is the Ganesha of writers, Michael. He's holding his broken tusk in his hand, uh, because in the story of how Ganesha took, took dictation from the seer in order to write the Mahabharata, the great epic of Hindu literature, Ganesha ran out of writing materials, so he broke off a tusk to finish writing a Mahabharata. So I have the writer's version of Ganesha, which he not only helps the writer to get through, the god actually takes dictation from the writer. If only we could manage that. <laughs> a shameless plug for awe, the automatic writing experience. <laughs> and it is about taking dictation to and from spirit. But what's interesting to me is about Ganesha. If we want to talk about uh, <laughs> writer's angst, creative angst, the breaking off of one tu one's tusk to complete. We've been there. Robert, You, I know you've been there. I've been there. Every writer has been there. I've been there. I mean, I'm I'm not a plodder. Writers have different ways of coming at things. I write my journal every day. I mean, that is essential practice to me, writing a journal. I would say to anybody with, who's with us, you want to get good at this dreaming. You want to get more self-aware in life. For goodness sake, keep a journal. Write things down every day if you remember dreams or when you do start with that. But I've had the feeling sometimes when I write a book, and I write a book very fast when I'm ready. When I'm ready, it might take me years to be ready, but when I'm ready, I move fast. Sometimes I feel I'm like one of those old Mississippi river boats where they've run out of fuel, but they're in some kind of race and they're tearing up the decks and the deck chairs in order to feed the furnace and get there. So, you know, I have my own sense of what breaking off the tusk is like. Yes. <laughs> well put. All right. I want to dive into lucid dreaming and the specifics of it. But before we do that, I want to address one more thing that really has to do with this bridge between worlds. Which is, well, that's actually interesting. Okay, before I even go there, we'll back up several steps. Carl Jung, the dream world is the waking world. The waking world is the dream world. Thoughts? Did Jung say that? I don't remember that from Jung's writing. I mean, yes. I'd rather like it. I'd rather like it. You know where he said it? No. No, right, and, well, and if no, I'm I, misquoting, because we're going to both I'm go a, looking I'm, I'm afterwards. A, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a source detective, and lots of quotes are attributed to people that don't check out. I like the statement. I might say that. I don't actually believe that Jung said that. But So let's, let's, let's pursue the thought or pursue Jung, but let's not a absolutely attach them to each other. All right. I like that. And we'll both go hunting afterwards, as will our audience who's watching this, who will be the ultimate arbiter. Absolutely. I mean, we, we need we need to be fact we need to be fact checkers about these things. You know, I started out as a junior professor of ancient history, and I was an investigative reporter for a while. So I'm very suspicious about quotes. I, I want the source. I'm also a, a, a fervent researcher. I, I own fourteen thousand books, including most of yours that have been published in his life or posthumously, and I've read most of them carefully. So I'm a hawk about these things because I want us to get it right. We're going to quote somebody, let's for goodness sake get it right. 
Thank you. Would you then say, as you just uh, inferred, implied, or directly said, the dream world is the waking world? Uh, I'd say that the waking world is also a dream. Uh, it's not the same thing. They're not identical. They are different worlds, but they have more in common than some of us realize. And often as a, you know, re as a very, very active dreamer, I will feel that switching back and forth between dream and waking reality is as simple as stepping back and forth between two rooms in a house or between two worlds. But they are two worlds. Uh, their rules can be similar. Their content can be similar. It can be wildly different. Things can happen in this life. Uh, that are unexpected. I mean, I didn't expect my host today to appear with a rooster under his arm before we started talking. I mean, that sounds like a dream symbol, doesn't it? What does it mean if your host appears with a rooster before you start talking? Uh, so so uh, part of the game of being a lucid dreamer in the fullest sense, a shamanic lucid dreamer, I would say, my kind of dreamer, is that you notice with your eyes wide open and all your senses are a quiver all the symbols and signs that are pulsing around you in ordinary life. The world around you is alive and it's dreaming and it's trying to speak to you. So dreaming isn't just about what happens with your eyes closed, whether that means sleep or lucid dreams or that liminal space between sleep and awake or the shaman's journey or meditation. Dreaming is also about going in the world, understanding that you are in a dream world and that everything might be speaking to you if you're willing to pay attention. So in that sense, uh, the waking world is a dream world. And the dream world is a waking world in the sense that you can wake up to the fact that you're in a deeper reality and there are things behind the curtains of our consensual hallucinations of our everyday perception that are really interesting to observe and to participate in. So dreaming can be waking up. But this is not equivalent to what you quoted. But it circles around it, buzzes around it. It circumambulates, as Jung liked like to say. Jung sometimes said he often couldn't understand what was going on in a dream, but he walked around and around and it circumambulated for a while something would come. We've got matching. Oh, I love it. Growing big dreams. Everybody, it's you need at least... Big. Two copies of this. Growing big dreams. Get one for you. Get one for a loved one. Get three copies. Get one for your local library as well. And then get all the automatic writing experience so you can be writing in this state as well each and every day. Look at this explosive color. It's a bit like Liz Gilbert's book, Big Magic. And the reason it is a bit like that is I dreamed. I dreamed, I dreamed before I wrote the book that its cover looked a bit like Big Magic. And when I'd done the book, I told the art director of my publisher, and she came up with this cover. So it's consciously a little bit like Big Magic. But the other thing, very quickly, because we had all this baby talk earlier, is on my way to this book, I dreamed there's a knock on my door, the, the street door of my house, and I open it, there's a baby basket in the street, Michael, and tied up in pink and blue ribbons is the typescript, the manuscript of the book. And I know it's my new book, and I knew it was going to be this book. And at that moment, with the baby basket dream, I knew I had to do the book. And it really sort of gave me the push to go forward. So I just want to say to anybody who might be interested in this, that one of the things to look at with baby dreams is, you know, you might be fortunate like Michael and Jessica, who's looking forward to physical babies coming into the world. But your baby dream might be about a new project, whether it's a book or something else, a creative life project. That's a very interesting kind of dream to play with. I'm I'm doing my best to keep us fully on track. This is just too much fun, Robert, but I've got to ask red. You have red at the top. You have a red for growing big dreams. What's the symbolism? Why did you choose red? Well, I didn't actually choose it, but you have fire flickering behind you, Michael. So you know perfectly well that red is a color of blood and fire and passion. So those would be very good cover, co colors to bring into play if you're talking about growing big dreams of life. You want fire, you want juice, you want passion, you want desire, you want to manifest your heart's desires, your deepest yearnings. So it's a good choice, but I actually didn't say I want red all over the cover. I'm very happy that we got it. Very good. So last thing, then, the, then we really will get into how we begin here. Last week before our interview, and it's taken several attempts to get this interview flying off the ground. Very interesting. I am driving back from a hike. I want to get back quickly because I want to dive into your books more and really be prepared. I was so excited to speak with you. And in front of me, there was a minivan coming to me and a little bird flew under the minivan. 
got spun around and I'm going, oh God, no. Made it out. You could see it shaking itself off like this is right out of Disney. Shaking itself off mid-flight, checking, making sure it's okay and buzzing off. And to me, that meant a little birdie had told me to slow down and not rush. Hmm. Very nice. Very nice. Can I tell you a dream story from my life that comes to me in the presence of your episode on the road? May I yes, do that? May I tell you do. a dream story? Okay, this is from quite some time ago. It illustrates many things, including the fact that we see the future very often before things happen. Uh, so many years ago, I dreamed that I'm watching a funny little dog, silly little dog, cute but silly, with fake antlers for some pageant. He runs out on the road. He's killed by a car. He's revived by a bizarre character who doesn't conform to human expectations. And he comes back. That's the dream. I have no feelings about the dream in particular. It feels like watching a movie. I have a 6 a.m. flight to catch. I rush to the airport. I catch the, the flight. I miss my connection. Life gets interesting, Michael, when your plans get screwed up. You're off schedule. The trickster energy comes into play. This is the moment to be alert to synchronicity. So I'm sitting next to an attractive woman who turns out to be a well-known writer and later invites me to do a workshop in her town. Uh, she notices I've got my then newly published book, Conscious Dreaming. She says, may I read this? I mean, this happens to me when I travel. May I read that? Oh, sure. Can't talk to her anymore. I look up at the screen for the in-flight movie. There's a silly dog, fake antlers, Christmas pageant. He's killed on the road, poor doggy. He's magically revived by a bizarre character, the Archangel Michael, portrayed by John Travolta in the movie Michael. Now, you know, this this silly little story, I mean, it made me think, okay, if you can dream about something as trivial as the in-flight movie on the wrong plane, you can probably dream about bigger things. In fact, the whole day became fascinating. Missing my connection led to all sorts of other things. But that's what comes to me in the presence of your story about the little birds surviving the encounter with the vehicle. Everything means something. You know, we know there's a common attitude, you know, it doesn't mean S, you know what. But my attitude is that everything means something. Uh, it, it doesn't mean not necessarily all that important. It might be a small importance. But it's worth looking at things with an eye to what is the meaning? What's the meaning? What's going on here? And how can I apply this? And, and to me, if I see something in the dream world and then I recognize it in the waking world, I want to take particular, I want to take a snapshot. Where am I? What am I doing? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? Because this synchronicity did not happen by coincidence. It's some sort of a wake-up call, and so I really want to understand the meat of what's going on at this moment. Well, you're quite right. It did happen by coincidence, but we don't know how to use that word. Coincidence means things that fall together. Synchronicity is just a synonym for coincidence invented by Jung because he got fed up with people being incapable of talking about meaningful coincidence. I coined another word. I'm not as great a classical scholar as Jung, but I coined another word, I love chiromancy. It. It brings the word kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, the, the, the name of the Greek god of opportunity time, jump time, a moment when you've got to act rather than just chronological time. It puts it together for mansi, which is about divination. So the kairomancer, which is what I want to train you to be, anybody who's with us and anybody else who's interested, is someone who is forever poised to navigate by synchronicity, to notice, as Michael did, what's going on with the bird that survives the vehicle, to notice a child's chalk drawing on the street, to notice an odd phrase spoken by a stranger you know, into their cell phone. To notice these, to notice what the tree is saying, what the sound of the wind and the leaves are saying, to notice these signs all around us all the time, and to be open to getting that shiver of recognition, that that you know, the chicken skin moment when you recognize something is happening beyond ordinary logic, and you might want to do something about it, at least say thank you, because you know at that moment of synchronicity, you're not alone in the universe. You're in the midst of animate forces that are around you. Thank you. I'm going to drive people nuts by doing one more. I can't, I, we're just riffing. Forgive me, everybody. We will get to lucid dreaming here. A reincidence. Well, reincidence is a, I, another word I bet. Reincidence is when coincidence runs in the stream, runs in riffs. It's not just something that happened in that moment. You're thinking about some someone and they call you up. You have an image in your mind and you see it in the street. It's not just about one of those things. It's about a series of incidents, one after another after another. There's one in Jung's writings. He was thinking about a fish. You know, he's a symbolist, he's an archetypal character. He's thinking about the symbolism of the fish in religion and mythology. And in uh, 36 hours, the fish appears in his physical reality in six unexpected ways, including a huge dead fish on top of the seawall of the lake wall of his place on the lake. So he notices the world is saying, you're thinking about a fish? 
I'm going to give you some fish. And by the way, Michael, we're already talking about lucid dreaming. Because if you want to get good at lucid dreaming, you better start practicing lucid uh, waking. Lucid, lucid waking. You better start becoming more self-aware as you go about in the world, because once again, the world is dreaming with you. The world is dreaming around you. You're magnetic. You draw or repel things to you according to the energy and attitudes you carry. This is the old law of attraction. It's never been a secret. It's been sometimes expressed in rather foolish ways, but the law of attraction, the law of sympathy, the ancient philosophers called it, has always been operative. So you want to be a lucid dreamer. Don't forget to be lucid in the dream of waking life. And that actually will help you to be more lucid in relation to your dream life as well. Thank you. So I'm going to want to dive into that time willing before we get to the end, which is being more lucid in our waking life. But can you go over the basics, the steps? How do we wake in our dreams? Well, waking in your dreams is one thing. Entering dreams in a waking state is related and not exactly the same. There are all sorts of ways you can try to train yourself to wake up inside a dream to the fact that you're dreaming. You can notice markers, for example. You can notice that you're with dead people and they're alive, and this is an ordinary reality. You might do the Castaneda thing of looking at your hands. You might do the thing of looking at the mirrors. People will tell you to check whether you can read or not, and you can't read reliably. That means you're dreaming. I disagree with that. Because I read immensely in my dreams as well as in ordinary life. I don't believe anybody who tells me you can't read in your dreams. I do it all the time. And sometimes I bring back whole pages back. I certainly bring back phrases and paragraphs very frequently. So there are all sorts of methods for training yourself to ask, am I dreaming while you're asleep? But the difference between my approach or the additional aspect of my approach, which could be called shamanic lucid dreaming, though for simplicity, I tend to call it active dreaming, and the wake up during the fact that you're dreaming during your sleep approach, which is standard lucid dreaming, is this. I teach people that the easiest way to become a lucid dreamer is to start out lucid and stay that way. Stay that way. What do I mean? Well, there are two royal roads for this as far as I'm concerned. The first is what I call dream reentry. Okay, you have a dream. It might be an image from your life. It doesn't have to be a sleep dream. Or it might be an image from meditation or from a shamanic journey. You have an image that has juice for you. It's something you need to know more about. Maybe it has the energy of fear. Maybe you've been having nightmares or scary dreams and you'd like to finish with that. Figure out what's going on and do something about it. Maybe the image has the, the, the atmosphere of romance and adventure you'd like more for its own sake. Maybe there's something there you'd like to understand. Why is your deceased grandmother in your living room in your dream last night? Maybe you'd like to talk to her. Maybe you'd like to talk to a spiritual guide or teacher. They turn up in dreams all the time, by the way. Your authentic spiritual guides often turn up in your dreams wearing the costumes and disguises appropriate to your level of understanding and degree of comfort. So you might have all sorts of reasons to be curious uh, about something that has come to you in a spontaneous way, let's say in a sleep dream, or some image that is with you from a past experience, you can learn to do this. You can learn to take your personal dream or your personal image and use it as a doorway to go into the space of the dream world and go beyond what you remember. You might simply want to gather more information. Is that car crash a possible future car crash or is it symbolic? I need to know. Because if I'm dreaming a possible future, I'd like to avoid that car crash. That might be one reason. Is that nameless terror that I feel in the presence of that dark shape something I can resolve by going back into the dream, willing myself to stay in the dream conscious until I confront my fear and resolve it some way or another? Can I talk to my deceased grandmother? Why not? If she was in my dream, I could probably go to where she was. Can I go back to that place of romance? and discovery and freedom and adventure. Well, I've been there already. I can go again, just as if I've been to a house in this world, I can go there again. So the dream re-entry, which is you know, what I, one of the core techniques of what I teach, is one of the ways of embarking on a lucid dream adventure. And Michael, it can take you very, very deep and far. And another thing is terribly simple. I might call it to people who are meditators, horizontal meditation. I mean, it's operating in that liminal space, that, that border zone between sleep and awake. You're not awake, you're not asleep, you're somewhere in between. And you might be in that state before sleep and you just open to what comes to you. You might be in that state in the middle of the night. Uh, you've woken up, gone to the bathroom, you can lie in bed and just watch images rise and fall. Or you can actually set yourself an objective. You could say, oh, I'd like to have an adventure. I'd like to to go back to that place I dreamed about. Hey, I, you can use a life memory. I'd like to be on that beach in Aruba instead of stuck in the house <laughs> in a gritty northeastern town. I mean, you could do it that way. 
So you can learn to more consciously explore from that launch pad, that base camp of what sleep researchers call the hypnagogic zone, which means the zone between sleep and awake. Tinkerbell put it better. It's, a, it's only in the movie of Hook. I had to look it up to check the other day. It's not in any of J. M. Barry's novels. It, Hollywood does things, some things right. The script writers for Hook wrote and attributed the line to Tinkerbell. She says to Peter Pan, who's sad because his fairy friend is going away, she says, look for me in the place between sleep and awake. And she says, that's where I'll always love you. That's where you could find me. So we're talking now. It's delicious when it comes from fairy, from, from the fairy tink. Look for me in the place between sleep and wake. That is a great sandlot, great training ground for lucid dreaming. And many of my friends who teach and write about lucid dreaming don't spend nearly enough time on this. There's liminal space and the possibility of the dream re-entry. You've got all these mnemonics, mild, and all these other things. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, uh, some of them work. And, and the castigator hands thing and variants on it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But frankly, for me, Michael, more important than techniques for telling yourself you're dreaming inside a dream is, in any state of reality, to recognize you have free will, you have a power of choice. You have the power to explore how much you can accomplish. You don't have to take orders. You don't have to fit into some boilerplate scheme of things. You can te test the boundaries of possibility, whether you're dreaming, waking, or anywhere else. And that's what I want to do. I want to train people to be conscious choosers in this world and in other worlds. Thank you. So let's let's go to, to Royal Road number one. You have a past dream. Maybe it's a recurring dream in your life. And and I, I liken this, uh, a past dream is like having a charged hotel key. You get it charged by the curator of the hotel. You can then put it in the door and unlock the door and go back in because now you've been there once. That key is charged. How do we use that key to get back, to re-enter that dream? Well, that's a lovely analogy. I like that very much. I might even borrow it from you, Michael. It's good, the charged room key. Well, I mean, the answer is partly in your question. I mean, if you have a key to a place where you've been before, you can go there again, just as in ordinary life. You have a room in a hotel and you have a key, you can go there again. It's the same principle. Okay, you went there in a dream, but a dream is also its own reality. You could go there again. Now, the thing is to develop the energy and attention to go there effectively. So you're going to ask yourself a couple of things. What do I want to know, for example? You can ask yourself a couple of questions to get ready for the journey of dream reentry. What do I want to know at this point? What do I want to do? They're not the same question. What do I intend to do? Suppose I can open that door and I'll find that the hotel room, like the TARDIS and Doctor Who, is much vaster than any ordinary space. If I go into this expansive space, this magical space, what are the things I want to do? Talk to grandma? Dance with the bear? Uh, what, what do I want to fly with a dragon? Fly to another star system? What are my intentions? And then you need to set yourself up so that you have screened out intrusions, noise, pollution, interrupt, potential interruptions, that kind of thing. And so you have some energy for the journey. Now, the energy of your intention, maybe a little breathing uh, might be enough. Uh, you might like to use the shaman's way, which for me is drumming. I don't do much drumming for myself in private circumstances, but in my classes and workshops, and I'm always doing online courses these days, even though I don't travel so much, we're always using shamanic drumming to, uh, to speed and focus the energy that becomes your fuel, your, 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 your fuel for the journey. So shamanic journey works very well. And if you don't have a drum or can't use a drum, you can get a recording. I've made recordings of shamanic drumming. So that might be part of your way of maintaining power, in the sense of horsepower, fuel uh, for the journey and screening out distractions. So, you know, good intention, an energy, a, a, an image, a dream perhaps that has some real energy, some real traction for you, uh, uh, the ability to screen out distraction, the ability to stay on this in a focused way with a sufficient charge, if you borrow your charged room card again, sufficient charge to keep you going. Those are the other key elements. Thank you. And then what about if we're going to sleep, not if, everybody, almost without exception, will be going to sleep tonight. How do we stay awake as we're going to sleep? <laughs> well, you don't stay too awake or else you'll just stay in the cognitive, the cog the cog the cognitive trap and you'll find yourself thinking rather than dreaming, which might or might not be useful. You might find yourself just going over the day residue, as Freud called it, instead of getting somewhere else. It's a trick to just let yourself drift. I mean, if you're new to this, you might find that if you're awake on the cusp, you count your breaths for a while. This is not like counting sheep. 
you just count your breaths and you just notice if you're new to this, how long it takes by the count before the first spontaneous image arises. I mean, that, that's, that's an exercise to begin with. You also, if you're new to this, going to want to consider what effect your body posture in bed has upon what you're experiencing and how you can deal with it. I mean, some people do best at this kind of hypnagogic stuff uh, if they are lying on their backs. Some people do perfectly well lying in a different position. So these are things to consider as you start. And uh, whatever you're doing, you're going to want to, if you, if you want to get good at this, as with anything else, you need to develop a discipline and a practice. It's a fun discipline, but it does require you to start recording things. Otherwise, they'll be gone. I mean, William James, great American psychologist and philosopher, said something like he sees more than a thousand things in this drifty state in the space of 10 minutes. I think that's correct. I have the same impression. I was thinking about last night. I, I keep funny hours and do funny things in the middle of the night. But when I went to bed at one point, I'm lying there. The first thing I see is what looks like the weave of basketry, a woven basket, really beautiful, except it's in metal. And I get interested in this. What is this? And before I've decided that, a, a word is said very clearly in my mind, cadmium. Now, cadmium is a chemical element that's actually highly poisonous to humans. But it's also the name of a color, cadmium yellow, and it's got other resonance. So I grabbed my bedside notebook. Sometimes I write myself an email, but this was just a couple of words. So I grabbed my med I write it cadmium and basketry and metal. And I haven't yet resolved what the cadmium is about, but I've got clues. Now, this did not lead, those, in, those glimpses did not lead to a full-fledged lucid dream adventure. But what is likely to happen if you stay with this kind of thing for a while is, and sometimes it's good just to observe the rise and fall of the contents of your mind, maybe the contents of your personal subconscious, maybe the contents of your psychic environment, maybe the collective unconscious. You, you can you can discuss with yourself later on where it's coming from. Most certainly, some of it is not just coming from any aspect of your regular self, including your personal unconscious. You're being drawn into a transpersonal world of images and events, into a field of interaction, perhaps, between yourself and others. I and mean, let's understand this is the ancient understanding of dreaming. In dreaming, you may be traveling. You go to other places and you receive visitations. This is the ancient understanding, and it's probably shared by every human culture we can track back to the beginning. Our Western psychology is still rather blurry about this. Uh, I noticed when I started dreaming in an ancient form of the Mohawk Indian language, which I had to study because of my dreams, Michael, I speak some Mohawk, and I know some old spiritual vocabulary from the Iroquoian peoples. An elder of Onondaga, the capital of the Six Nations of the Longhouse, said to me, having heard some of my dreams of a shaman woman, mother of the wolf clan from long ago, he said, very matter-of-factly, oh, you made some visits and you received some visitations. Now, that goes on in dreams. It is very prone to happen in this hypnagogic state, this twilight zone we are talking about. This is prime time for transpersonal contact with inner and transpersonal guides. Prime time has been recognized by such by the Greek philosophers, by yogis, and by others. By the way, this is a kind of everyday yoga of consciousness. No nonsense, no particular words required, no particular religious orientation required. It will just happen if you let it happen and develop the practice of attending to it. Thank you. And I, I, I want to go to the double entendre in prime time. With that said, I was looking to see if I had it by my side. I thought I do. I guess I put it away. I, I ordered uh, online a specific dream journal last week to, to set the intention. This was before I knew I was going to be interviewing you of, of taking a more thorough um, uh, recording of my dreams at night. I always go into my automatic writing in the morning and, and do some dream interpretation. But I wanted to get more serious about it. And it came... On last Thursday, it arrived right before our interview. And I'm like, well, how synchronistic is that? With that said, you use the word prime time. And I want to double entendre that for a second. Maybe that's how you meant it, which is it is prime time to have visits and visitations when we dream. But my guess is this time also of humanity, it may be more important than ever that we are visited from the other side, that we start to get lessons during this time and then bring them back into the waking dream. Absolutely. I mean, we're only going to get through this if as many of us as possible start to remember what it's all about, what life is all about, what soul is all about. I mean, I, in my personal mythology, I think it's very useful to adhere to the idea that we came here for a purpose, even if that seems very unclear from time to time. It seems that life is very disappointing. Even life seems more like a prison than a playground. My personal impression is 
we all came here with a purpose. I remember when I was living on the farm, it was on the farm, which I bought because of an old white oak tree and a red-tailed hawk. When I was living on the farm, starting to dream in an archaic form of the Mohawk language and having connections with a, an ancestor of mine, an Anglo-Irishman who came here in the 18th century. Uh, and my life was changing, and I eventually decided to follow the track of a dream teacher, for which there's no career track in our culture. When I was up there a long time ago, there was a knock on the door of the farmhouse where I was now living, three o'clock in the morning. I opened the door. Under bright moonlight, there's a man who looks pleasant but a bit simple. I'm thinking, is this some guy, some Jesus freak, sometimes some guy peddling religion at the door? And he says to me, I come from my father's house, and I get a shiver. He mentions a Scottish name, and my father's family are Scottish. And then he says to me, what is your contract with God? And I wake from it. I hadn't realized it was a dream. It was not a lucid dream, a very vivid dream. But that's the moment in which I knew it was a dream, and I woke with a, with a shock. And I'm startled, and I'm even sort of terrified because, my God, if he asked me this, I must have a contract with the divine. What is it? How can I not remember it if this is true? And that actually set me anew, not for the first time, but it's sort of reset me in life, half a lifetime ago now, to thinking about that. What is the purpose? What was I? What were you doing before we came here? That space between lives, uh, which will follow our physical death as well. Yeats was said with poetic clarity, it's useful to know something, a little something about what happened before conception and what will happen after death. I agree. It's useful to know a little something about what happens before conception and what will happen after death. And one of the ways of knowing these things is, of course, to dream in the ways I'm talking about, which is certainly to pay attention to spontaneous sleep dreams. They're important. They show us things we'd never think about otherwise. They wake us up to what the Jungians call the shadow, the aspects of ourselves we'd rather not look at. They show us the possible future in spontaneous and authentic ways. They introduce inner guides and do so much else. But we can also learn to dream, as we are discussing, lucidly, consciously, in all sorts of interesting ways. And those dreams can bring us to the memory and then the ability to act upon our sacred contracts, the purposes that we agreed to before we came here. And that can change everything. Thank you. It's interesting that you said uh, uh, maybe it was subconscious, maybe it was very conscious that it, there wasn't somebody in this society, this isn't your words at all, um, who guides people on things like this. Well, now there, there is you. Uh <laughs> well, well, Michael, just thank you. Let me just pick up. I didn't have a Robert. I mean, I had a Robert on the inner planes. I had I had a Robert who on other planes who knew more than I did at the time. But today, whether they like it or not, people have this Robert. I didn't have it. So with that said, you said follow the track of the dream teacher. I believe those were your exact words. Can we call in a Robert on the other side and say, hey, I probably do have a, a soul contract. There's probably something I'm here to do. Can I call in a main guide to help me figure this out? Certainly. I mean, I think actually, I mean, there are different ways of looking at these things, but I think the most important guide and teach you're going to find in your life is what the Sufis call beautifully the soul of the soul. And there are all sorts of synonyms for higher self, greater self, over soul, etc. The soul of the soul. I think it is by meeting and getting to know yourself, great big Jungian S, on a higher level, which is the hub, perhaps, of all the different aspects of yourself and maybe of your multidimensional family. Because I've come to believe, not to believe, I, I have experienced the fact that my life and possibly yours is connected to dramas being lived out across place and time. And you can talk about this as reincarnation, or you can look at it, uh, as Jane Roberts Seth did, memorably, as a play of many counterpart or parallel lives all going on at the same time in a spacious now. I mean, that is what I think is the secret logic of many things that go on in life, that I, for example, am connected to that Scottish Druid. Can, can you repeat that dead. line one more time, more slowly, so that people <laughs> can so, absorb so that fast. in? I yes. Can, I can't possibly remember it now, but I can paraphrase it. You know, I can paraphrase it. Okay, let's say this. I have come to believe that for me and possibly for you, the secret logic of life is that what I think I am doing is connected to what personalities in other places and times are doing in their lives. Their lives are located in past time, in future time, or in parallel time. But from a certain point of view, it's all happening now in a great wheel of multidimensional activity. What they do affects me and what I do affects them, forwards, backwards, sideways. 
So, you know, where does reincarnation fit into this? Well, it might fit or it might actually be a distraction. I don't have to think that I am the reincarnation of that Anglo-Irishman from the 18th century who lived in the Mohawk Indians to understand that what went on in his life is and has been intensely relevant to my life and my choices today. I don't believe that that Arundiwano, that Iroquois woman of power, that mother of the wolf clan, would have called me had she not been connected with him in the time that they shared, for example. Uh, am I connected to that priestess scientist seven generations beyond me who's working to redeem the earth after it's basically almost been destroyed by the greed and brutality of men and values dreaming as an essential life tool? Is she my reincarnation or my descendant? I don't have to believe that in order to recognize that I have a responsibility to her and she has a connection with me. Am I responsible for that parallel Robert who made different choices as a writer? And is writing very superior historical spy, level, spy novels and making 10 times as much money as me, and who I do not envy, but who I notice in my dreams and sometimes join in adventures in my dreams. I'm connected with all these characters. I think you, if you look further at it, and you can look at it through dreaming, might find that you have a very interesting, indeed a fascinating, multidimensional life involving other members of your soul family, other personalities living, as I say, in past future and parallel lives. And if you can start to connect and look in consciously, wow, what lessons and gifts might you derive? It's very interesting. Thank you. So that begets, wow, this is fascinating. There are so many people who are watching this today who are saying, I feel stuck. Either I'm not going where I want to go in life, or like you said, I don't know where we can go into the liminal space, into the space between two worlds, start to pull on these strings, understand who and what we are, who and where we came from or are going, understand all of the overlaps. I used to pray every Friday night at Temple, and I imagined that it was a node in time. We're all past, present, and future Michaels. We're all coming together at this moment. We can go to that space and that will completely change on some level everything about our existence. Mm, that's beautifully said, Michael, and I like it, like your sense of what was happening at Temple. When you talk about pulling the threads, you know, this is exactly what goes on with the figures personified as fates, feminine beings in different mythologies, Scandinavian, Greek, etc. They're weaving, they're spinning, they're pulling threads. In Scandinavian mythology, the fates, the norns, are pulling the threads of the global web of weird, W-Y-R-D. They're pulling the threads. The way they pull the threads changes things. And it's understood that maybe we, as we grow in understanding and gain admission in various ways, maybe we can begin to pull the threads a little bit. And maybe this is what's happening already when we start noticing things in the world around us. Here's where the observer effect, famous in the theories of physics comes into play. The observer effect says, in effect, things only take an established form, a definite form, when they are observed. The active observation brings things into being out of a quantum soup of possibilities. What does that mean to you and me? It might mean in relation to those stuck places. If you start seeing things differently, if you start noticing, for example, that the world is speaking to you through that living symbol, that moment of awakening, that moment of observation, that moment of reckoning, brings different things onto the path of manifestation. There's a wonderful story, a famous story about Jung's practice of synchronicity that comes to my mind. He's with a patient who is stuck. Her therapy with two therapists, with two analysts is broken down. She's not doing well with Jung. There are all sorts of complications. She starts telling a dream about being given a gold Egyptian scarab, you know, the scarab of ancient Egypt, symbol of rebirth. Jung notices at his window a green gold flying beetle a rose chafer, the closest thing to a scarab you would find in Europe. Jung goes to the window because he's a chiromancer. So he's ready to seize the opportunity. He grabs the beetle. He carries it to the woman and says, here is your scarab. And the stuck place is completely overcome. She's not stuck anymore. The therapy begins to prosper. Their relationship blossoms. Why? Because someone was alert to what the world was giving them. You know, so what I offer in growing big dreams and in my courses and in my work are tools and resources beyond the obvious, ones that will take you out of your stuck places, ones that will sometimes grab you by the neck and shake you up because your dream producers, you know, when you're not doing well, might use shock in order to arouse you. 
They like to use shock and humor, our dream producers. Some of our dreams are like movies, all sorts of different things going on in different dreams. But some of them definitely feel to me like the productions are the secret film production studio that each of us has where dreams are cooked up for us, to entertain us, to educate us, to shock us, to humiliate us, to make us look in a mirror, in a mirror at our own silly actions and attitudes and do something better. So you don't want to miss that because there are your opportunities to get out of your stuck places. There is the scarab beetle at your window waiting to be grabbed. Thank you. I want to talk in a minute about producing our own dreams or steps to bring the magic of dreams to everyday life. But before I do that, what are, this is a fascinating term, who are our dream producers? Well, you know, they're questions that cannot be answered. They must be lived, Michael. I can't answer that question for you, but I can take you to a place. And, and actually, if we have time to do the little exercise we're talking about, that might be the proscenium. In other words, the outer entrance to the kind of place I'm thinking about. It won't take you to your dream producer probably today, but maybe it's a way of approaching it. Uh, I think you have to approach your dream producer in your own way. I had a guy once who was horrified by dreams in which he is being brutally treated as a slave by a female dominatrix who r reminded us of the old Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, thing, gothic things on TV. In fact, uh, we actually drew a picture of her as Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. And he was gay. He was gay. This had no, this had no attraction to him at all. He said, why do I keep dreaming of this horrific woman who's treating me as a sex slave? I said, let's go into the dream. So we're doing dream re-entry. We're doing a little work together in the, around the workshop. So we're, we're, we agreed, we'll go back inside the dream together. We'll talk to her, ask her who she is. So we do that. We ask her her name. and She says, my name is Mammon. Well, Mammon is the name for the commercial spirit uh, of finance in the dirtiest sense, Mammon, and give, giving over your worship to, to money instead of God. Okay, that's interesting. And then I say to him, why don't you ask to meet the producer or the director? Who's putting this on? The person who's who's hired this this actress, to, and and we did. I, mean, I say we because we're actually journeying together. That's something you can learn to do also. So we went to his production studio, and they had a very dark sense of humor and deed. We had no doubt at the end of our expedition that, of course, some part of himself, some, which is to say, some part of his larger self, not the ordinary self had been staging these Elvira Mistress of the Dark Dream to shock him into not making a life choice that was confronting him. Basically, would he go back to the kind of commercial fast track he'd been on, having retired early with pots of money, live a different kind of life? And the answer that emerged was, no, I'm going to continue to live in my villa on the beach in Spain and not go back to the realm of mammon. So he, he found out who his producers were by, uh, by going to talk to them. There's a very funny story in another of my books, a book called Mysterious Realities, which has all sorts of adventures uh, from this dream traveler's life about looking at dreams from the dream producer's point of view. So in that story, you'll get a humorous look at why your dream producers might be repeating dreams to you because you won't get the message or you won't take action. So they keep giving you the same frustrating dream, maybe with minor modifications to try to bring you awake. If we get that dream time after time after time again, do we just do as we talked about earlier? Go and actually re-enter that dream, this time with the intention of learning from it so that we can move to the other side or so that we can gain the nugget the producers are trying to give us? Well, first of all, we have to make some distinctions. We have to do some clarifying. Is this actually a repeating dream or is it a similar theme uh, echoed in slightly different ways because you always want to look at the specifics of the dream. Uh, what's happening in one dream is not necessarily exactly what's going on in another. So look and see, is it actually essentially the same dream or is it a series of scenarios involving different issues? Or is it something completely different, which is a serial dream? A serial dream is which one in which things are developing in installments over time. Serial dreams are very interesting. In serial dreams, for example, you might find yourself living a life in a parallel universe where you made different life choices. So that is a separate category, the most fascinating category of dreams to me, by the way, because I'm very interested in how we live in the multidimensional universe and how we can do that consciously. But suppose it is essentially the same dream. Well, okay, if you really don't understand what it's about, dream reentry might be your method. But very often you do have an inkling of what it's about, but you're not doing anything to act on the information. So what might be required is not so much dream reentry, further exploration, but figuring out how to apply the information and take physical action and physical life to honor and apply the message from the dreams. 
that is absolutely essential. I call my overall approach active dreaming. Because I don't, I'm not content with analysis. I mean, to reduce a dream to a set of conceptual concepts, what good is that? I want energy. I want applied energy and guidance from the dream world in regular life. And that is real magic. Real magic is the art of bringing gifts from another reality into this one. And that's what we do when we do the right kind of dream work. So it's action that's always going to be required. If you've had an interesting experience in dreaming, what are you going to do about it? Celebrate it, certainly keep a journal, maybe do something creative with, make a picture, make a story, uh, go and buy something in the color red. If that's important to you today, you know, uh, share it with other people in the right way and learn to do that, take action. Thank you. A few last things, then, then I want to go into this exercise. Really, really, I want to dive into this, this concept of bringing the magic of dreams into your life um, in a minute. But you just, you just flipped a switch for me. I used to have all of these dreams of diving into a pool of water, going through a series of tunnels, and then out, uh, em- ending up um, popping out in the ocean. Until last year, I was invited to a was it Nobel Peace Prize summit in uh, in the Mayan in the uh, Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, and discovered these things called cenotes, water holes, some of which opened up in the ocean. And I had seen them in my dreams. In fact, I went on top of a pyramid and I had been there in my dreams. I haven't had the dreams since. And I'm having an ooga booga moment, Robert, going, A, I get to dive into that again. And then B, what do we do with people who aren't dreaming right now? Hmm. Well, it's very interesting. I've been to Yucatan. I've seen some of this. Um, And of course, as you probably know, some people were actually drowned in cenotes, the sacrifices to intercede with the gods rather than the way the druids will kill people in various ways and sometimes drown them. We're going to send you to the other side to intercede with the deities. So cenote is to be looked at with some respect and some caution, probably. But nonetheless, it's very interesting as an example of probable precognitive dreaming. Uh, an experience like that would tell me, if it were mine, a couple of things. First of all, I dream the future. I dream future events before they take place. Uh, my dream self scouts ahead of me and sees things I don't know about, or maybe the future reaches back to me with memories of what already, already exists in some four-dimensional universe, the different views about how this happens. The interesting thing is that it does happen. And from my point of view, once we have learned that, once you've made the realization that you dreamed the Senate before you went there, well then, okay, you can maybe, it might be open to the more interesting idea that if you can see a future that will take place. Maybe you can see a future that is possible or probable rather than predetermined. Maybe you can bring information from the possible future, make better choices. So you get to the place that you'd like to get to and avoid the place you'd rather not get to. So that moves us into the free will aspect of things rather than deterministic things. The other thing is the numinosity of it. In other words, you're in sacred territory. You're in ancient and sacred territory where things are done for dark or bright reasons, according to your point of view that have to do with the interaction between humans and gods, humans and spirits, humans in a certain state of nature, humans and the powers of water and the water spirits. That's really interesting. Uh, Everybody has dreams, Michael. Even the hard hit who says, I don't have dreams is only saying I don't remember. This is part of the beauty of making dreams the center of a daily practice because we all have access to material. It doesn't say that anybody's going to turn into a world-class dreamer. It takes practice. And there is a little bit of nature and inheritance involved. I mean, not everybody's born, nobody, not everybody's born to be an Olympic skier. I mean, I can basically just fall down a mountain, not ski it, not ski down it. So, you know, I could I used to be able to swim five miles. Not people can do that. I'm not an athlete, but you know, if I could swim five miles, I'm an Australian, I guess we're born, we're born with gills. But uh, but you know, we're not the same. So you're not going to be necessarily a world-class dreamer. Uh, you know, uh, by the way. The dominant word for shaman in Native American languages in North America means simply one who dreams. Radzenzots in Mohawk, one who dreams, one who dreams a lot, one who dreams proficiently. But you have access to the material. All you have to do is let the scales drop from your eyes and look at the world around you as a waking dream, as we were saying earlier. That will get you started. If you make a determination you want to play this game, it's as simple as starting by being ready to record something any night. You don't even have to say, I need to remember my dreams. I'd rather say I'd like to have some fun tonight and remember. I'd like to get a new story, make it a juicy intention. Then you write down something when you wake up. You don't have a dream. You write down something anyway. You're saying to your dream producers, those guys we were talking about earlier, hey, I'm here. 
I'm ready to catch. I'm ready to record. Give me something, you know. Uh, so the, the practice is terribly simple. But, you know, as Malcolm Gladwell said in Outliers, without 10,000 hours of practice, you don't get excellent at anything. It's the same thing with dream this dreaming. But as a dreamer, you have a, an advantage. You have a leg up because you can do so much of it in your sleep. And you do so much of it just drifting around the world, looking at the play of synchronicity around you. So it's not really a terribly grim practice. And it's amazing to me that we got so lost to ourselves and so lost to the realm, the thrumming, pulsing world of possibility around us in the day and in the night, that this ceased to be a central preoccupation for most human societies, for most of our evolution. Dreaming has been a primary practice. The first business of the day has often been to share dreams. Dreamers who are really good at what they did and can bring information to the community were highly valued, were precious. We lost all that. We developed all sorts of technologies and science, etc. But at the end of the day, where are we? Our best physicists say, I'm quoting John Wheeler, uh, but he's not alone. John Wheeler said the universe is more like a dream than anything else. If you want a model for the universe, a model for reality, it is a dream. That's what one of our physicists uh, said about, based on all the quantum revolution, all the relativity stuff. He said, we've just discovered the universe is a dream. Hey, you know, 10,000 years ago, dream shamans knew this and lived it. Wow, wow, wow. A few last thoughts, then we'll go into this practice. First off, I love the idea. In fact, uh, I, I've read about the Oshawara, a First Nation people down in Ecuador who wake up each morning. They gather up all the kids, or so the story goes, and they ask the kids, and this will determine where the tribe goes for the day, more or less. They ask the kids to share their dreams. What's the importance of sharing the dreams with a loved one or with their family or with those around us? Oh, this builds the best kind of relationship. And by the way, it is wonderful, wonderful entertainment. I mean, you know, in the age of video games and streaming TV, et cetera, this is a form of entertainment that we cease to value. I mean, what you're quoting from Ecuador is similar to what goes on in the Western desert of Australia, of my native Australia, where uh, the Kukaja, for example, one of the peoples of the Western desert, will get together. They're nomadic people. They get together while boiling the tea in the billy over the fire in the morning. And they'll tell a dream, and, and, and someone will say, good story, that one. Good story, that one. Story sweet as tea. I mean, so there's the entertainment function. That's part of it. We have a new story to tell. That's part of it. Don't let's underrate this. Our dreams are our original fresh stories, and there's such a gift in learning to tell our stories and make other people want to hear them. So as you practice sharing your dreams with other people, orally in particular, you're becoming more of a storyteller, more of a communicator, claiming the power and magic that that gives you. And it's developing a relationship that goes deep, a relationship of soul and heart with those with whom you're sharing. Now, in a community that values dreams, uh, the kids may or may not be the clearest dreamers, but the dreams are going to be heard with a number of things in view. Does the dreamer need help or assistance because of something that is being revealed in the dream? Does the dreamer, on the, the other hand, have a gift, a gift of power, a gift of connection with the spirits for the community? Does the gift, does the dreamer's dream contain survival information on something that will happen in the possible future that could affect the community? And how do you act on that? Is the dreamer revealing in the content of the dream, particularly if it's a child's dream, their connection with a spiritual ally that may be an animal guardian, for example, or a bird? or one of the ancestors, because we want to monitor that, follow it closely, because that such connections are greatly prized, and everybody in such a society would like to have a connection. Well, shamans, when they go dreaming, go travel famously with animal guardians, bird allies, etc. If I want to fly and see something as a track and see something of someone's possible future, I'll borrow the eyes and the wings of one of the birds that I know well, and I will feel myself traveling with the bird, sometimes as the bird, but typically with the bird, in order to see things. If I want to protect my space or offer protection to someone else, or maybe even transfer some healing energy to someone else, I might call on the bear or the lion or another animal that I know well and have known for decades who lives in my body, in my energy field, not just something to be looked up in a book or put up as a decal. Uh, the Ayarun is the only Iroquoian word for this. The power animal, the animal guardian, is a real energy which lives with the holder of that energy and can be transferred or used at a distance. Of course, you got burnt in Europe for talking this way <laughs> until not that long ago, but it is a way of being present in all the worlds safely and productively that... Uh, children understand 
you know, in our Western society, if you have a kid who's scared of things in the night, one of the things you can do to them after hugging them and reassuring them and listening very deeply to their dream and never telling them it's only a dream one of the, and getting them to spit out bad energy. One thing you can do for the child who's scared is say, okay, who's your favorite animal? Do you have a stuffed toy that represents that animal? Well, if not, we'll get you one. Okay, make the lion, make the jaguar, make the wolf your ally for the night. It really works. You've, you've got me in Ooga Booga land because I've got my childhood lion in the other room here, which as my parents were getting ready to move, they haven't moved yet. I, I brought it with me. Years ago, I was, I was on air doing an ad, making an advertisement for all the, the, the book, Automatic Writing Experience, in Colorado and out from behind me. Jessica's, uh, my wife is holding the, the camera and all of a sudden her jaw drops. We're indoors, but her jaw drops. I thought she was yawning. And finally, I'm like, I, I can't do this. You're not paying any attention. Well, what she pointed out and then showed me back in the tape is a mountain lion had jumped out from behind me. We caught it on camera. She caught it on camera. And I went into the dream world in my own way through automatic writing and got that that's your guardian angel, Maximilian, making himself appear in physical form through that lion. But it is a lion that is with you through all lifetimes. In terms of how guides appear to us, I am convinced there is a cosmic costume department for spiritual guides, and they dress up for the occasion. They, they, they dress, they, I'm absolutely convinced of this. They dress up in forms that we can perceive and receive and understand. And, and the, the mountain lion was huge in my life. It's not my primary form of connection with big cats, but it was a dream of a mountain lion that called me up, pulled me up, literally in the dream, to a place of the heart that guided my life tremendously some years ago. So there we go. Last couple questions, then I want to know where people can go, then let's, let's do a brief exercise here. What is a dream talisman? A dream talisman? Well, I mean, that would be something that you make based on your dreams that holds the energy of a particular dream. And it might be very simple. It might be a stone or a crystal. I mean, the Anishinaabe, otherwise called the Ojibwa, uh, used to make a practice in their shamanic dreaming of finding a stone that could hold the whole of a dream scene, not just its energy, but inside the stone they believed could be the place of the encounter. So you could actually not only carry the stone representing the energy of a sacred encounter, you could, by entering the stone shamanically in a state of shamanic lucid dreaming, you could meet again with the sacred powers and beings in the space that is now held and located in a stone you can carry in your hand. That'd be a pretty interesting dream talisman. Wow. With that said, how much can we use, can we set intention when going into our dreams to work in the dream world to create in this, I'll put in quotes, waking world? Oh, well, you can learn to do this, absolutely. But you know, this is, you're going to have to lay a foundation of practice. Uh, for example, if you're not keeping a journal, I don't want to talk to you about any of this. A journal is your fundamental tool. Uh, I, my, my, journal, my journals were beautiful, beautifully bound, beautifully designed journals when I was traveling all the time, and I'd write by hand, though I can't read by handwriting. Today, my journals that are kept by hand are basically art journals. I basically sketch because I go to the computer. Actually, I go to my phone and I email the dream report to myself. Then I go to the computer, and I have a format, a very effective format for journaling my dreams and a search engine. But if you're not going to keep a journal, I don't talk to you about any of this. Forget everything we've said. You've got to keep a journal. It's your fundamental practice. It's your magic book. It will be your scientific log of interesting things like precognition, parallel lights, etc. So keep a journal. Uh, if you're going to practice dream incubation, start out either very reverential or very simple and casual. They're not contradictory. If you have a huge issue in your life in which you'd like sacred help or guidance, you approach dream incubation as people have done across the ages. You're seeking the, you're enlisting the support of spirit, if you want to call it that, of a sacred power, of a sacred guide. Approach it accordingly. Make something in the way of a personal ritual. Make it up. Anything done with intention is ritual. I don't need to tell you, do some mumbo jumbo or, you know, or, or, or sachet of this or that. You can make up your own mind. Or alternatively, be uh, colloquial without being altogether casual. I sometimes say, show me what I need to see as an intention for the night. That takes some guts, you know. Takes some guts. Show me what I need to see. Or I'll say, because, you know, I've been shut up most of the time since the pandemic came in. I used to travel seven months out of ten. You can imagine how different my life has been. I'll sometimes say, I'd like to have an adventure tonight. And remember, <laughs> I'd like a new story. I might get more specific. I'd like to have dinner in Paris. You know, I'll set up fun intentions 
that don't really have great gravitas. But the result is usually I will come back from a trip feeling that I've been on vacation, that I went across the world. Sometimes I have a bit of travel for me, a bit of jet lag, the Irish equivalent of jet lag when I have these journeys. So get some practice, dream incubation. Read my books, for goodness sake. The most important book you will ever read on this is your own journal, but read my books. I mean, there are a dozen of them on different aspects of dreaming, creative imagination, and shamanism. The first was conscious dreaming. My goodness, I received some really hilarious guidance from spiritual guides dressed for the part when I was writing that book. The most recent is Growing Big Dreams. I mean, they're all invitations to adventure. Where can people go, Robert? Shameless plug. Uh, shameless? No. Beautiful plug. Where can people go, Robert, to find your beautiful work, to find Growing Big Dreams, and to find out more? Well, all my books are, you know, available from usual suspects, but my website is mossdreams.com, moss like my name, mossdreamsplural.com. That's my website. You'll find my books. You'll find a link to my blog, the Robert Moss blog, which is pretty interesting. It's fairly active. Uh, I've got public Facebook pages. Um, you can find those. I lead a lot of online courses. Uh, we're about to add some to the menu at my website. The Shift Network hosts some of my courses. We're launching a new one in the very near future. It might have been launched already, actually, depending on how the calendar pages turn. I also teach. This is the most important thing I do. I teach a three-year training for teachers of active dreaming, my name for my process. And we now have about 500 uh, certified teachers of active dreaming from more than two dozen countries, from Senegal to Seattle. Uh, and uh, they're carrying this into the world because this is a discipline. It's a fun discipline. Uh, we need people in our society who will work and play at midwifing the rebirth of the dreaming society in our world, in our time. It's urgent. It's needed. It's a connection to soul and purpose. And it's a way of building heart-centered communities. We need it now. I, I am going to... If you're listening to this and you made it this far in this interview, check out Robert's work and see about that term midwife is coming up time after time for us right now, Robert. See about becoming a midwife in this practice as well. Consider the three-year program. Consider doing the work because to me, it is the work on the quote-unquote other side that is going to change everything in the here and now. Yes, any last words of wisdom, Robert, you want to share before we dive into this exercise? Well, one of the most important things is that the only time perhaps is now. You know, maybe from a dreamer's perspective, maybe from the perspective of a traveler between worlds, past, future, and parallel time are all available and accessible right now. And in that knowledge, we can understand more of the secret logic of our lives and might even have the ability to draw gifts and lessons from other experiences, from other personalities, put it all together in a creative way. The other big thing that I must say is, uh, Michael, I don't want to talk to you if you don't have a sense of humor. I mean, uh, working, fundamental, working, oper operational sense of humor. I once said in a large lecture room many years ago uh, to a man who said, bottom line it for me, what is all this about? I said, remember to play. He said, what? He starts writing it down in his notebook. He's scowling, etc. And I say, you're in the wrong room. Get out of here. <laughs> you go and find the room that's right for you. And sense of play, humor, it goes deep. It's Mark Twain's humor. Mark Twain's life rode on a black river of personal tragedy. Yet he, his humor kept him going and kept others going. It's also the sense of divine comedy, of the commedia of Dante. Comedy isn't just, isn't just the stand-up comic. It's not the stand-up comic at all. It's the understanding that through the play of life and death, dark and light, there is a deeper logic and things are looked at from that other perspective. We see this, this world as a bridge between other worlds. Uh, we'll do better. So uh, don't leave home without your sense of humor. Don't return without it. See if you can rise to a sense of the divine comedy, which is likely to be easier for you if you adopt the practices we've been discussing in this conversation. I used to have, or they had me, I don't know how you call it, three coyote mixes. And when my coyote mix pumpkin was passing away, and it was her last day here on earth, and she knew it. She absolutely is full, fully cognitively aware, this is it. This is, this is uh, uh, time to cross over. She, on our last walk pointed out the grasshoppers to me. And if you've ever spent time with a coyote, they can laugh. 
They are the trickster, and they certainly can laugh. And she's looking at the, the, the grasshoppers hopping up and down and is absolutely just cracking up to show me the hilarity of this whole existence, to show me how much fun, how much joy, and, and how much um, entertainment there can be in all of it. Nice. Very nice. Would you have, we had discussed at the beginning, would you mind leading us through this brief exercise? All right. Um, if you're going to do this, everybody, uh, get yourself in a comfortable, relaxed position, close or half close your eyes. I'm going to create a gateway for you from your life memories. A gateway to what? A gateway to what we can call the dream cinema or the dream theater. We're going to take you to a place where you can retrieve a dream that you might have missed or see part of the screening of a new dream for your life. That's the kind of space we're talking about. It's a space in the imaginal realm, the realm of true imagination, which is a real world, uh, probably more diverse than the physical world. But we won't make any lectures about that. So let's start like this with your memory, with your memory. I want you to bring up the memory of a place like a movie theater or a playhouse, maybe a concert hall. Well, you've been excited at some point in your life by stories, by images, by music, by the actors. Something's gone on here that really got you going. So what is it? Might be from childhood. I often go back to a, a, a cinema in a modest neighborhood, a suburb of Melbourne, Australia, where I used to go for Saturday matinees. Maybe it's a place like that. Maybe it's a an art cinema or a big multiplex you know today, maybe it's a theatre, maybe it's an opera hall. Find your place, it might be a composite. Find a place like this, we'll call it from now on your dream cinema. Its fuller name is the Cinema of Lost and Found Dreams. Cinema of Lost and Found Dreams. Maybe that gives you a little free a little shiver. Anyway, that's where you're going, we'll just call it the dream cinema. I want you to find the memory, the image, the image, the visual of this place and let that grow strong on your mental screen so you can see the entrance of your dream cinema. There it is. And there are, there's a sign, there's maybe a number of movie titles, maybe some posters, and maybe what you're looking at initially is familiar. Maybe you're seeing titles and ads for productions that you've heard about or have already seen. They might be showing now. They might be from the past, but as you get closer to the entrance to your version of the dream cinema, the words change, the images change, you begin to get the sense that whatever's showing here, whatever has been showing here is about you. That these phrases, these titles relate to you, maybe your own dreams, your dreams of the night or your dreams of life. And now you're at the doorway, whatever it looks like, and you go in and you are in front of what? ticket counter, something like that, uh, security check, maybe. Uh, whatever, in fact, is in front of you, you're probably going to be asked to put something down. But don't skip this moment. You might be surprised to discover you've been carrying something. I wonder what it is. Backpack, luggage, briefcase, something that represents old duties, old obligations, old attachments, old addictions, old attitudes that they don't want you to bring in here. You might pick it up later, but they don't want you to bring it in right now because to get to the good show, you have to put down something of the old attitude. So don't resist the moment of being asked to put something down. And maybe later on, you'll have another look at what that was. Well, now you are there with the ticket person, let's say, with the, with the gatekeeper, the ticket person. And you're going to pay the price of entry by saying, I'm here for a dream I need to see now or I'm here for a dream I need for my life, or I'm here to, for a dream that I lost, or I'm here for a story I need for my life right now, something like that. Find your version of the phrase, I'm here for the dream I need right now. That would be good. And when you've expressed that intention, you are ushered into a viewing room. It's very comfortable, comfy chair, seems to be all about you. Seems to be empty, at least initially, though as you leave, you might notice there's someone with you. And there is a stage, there's a screen, maybe there's a curtain, the lights are dimming, the curtain's opening, something's flickering onto the screen or coming onto the stage. 
It's hard to get much to begin with. It's just, you know, a random bunch of images, like snatches of ads, snatches of trailers, maybe. And now something is dawning that is going to be the main show. Maybe there's a title. Maybe there's a scene from the film. Maybe if it's a theater, maybe the cast is on stage. Some lines are being delivered. You're getting a sense now of what this is. It's sort of familiar, maybe sort of shocking at the same time. What is the theme? What is the dominant image that's in front of you? Now, as it continues to play, you might find if you can go on with the journey, which we can't do with the show right now, but if you can go on the journey in your own imagination or in lucid dreaming, you might find you can get up and go through the screen into the scene and become an actor observer right inside the production. You might find that you can even make your way eventually to the director, to the crew behind the production, a theme we were talking about earlier. But for now, just having tested the portal, tested the viability of such a portal for you, you're going to gently come back, and as you come back, you're going to maybe notice some posters and some announcements of coming attractions. And again, they're probably all about you, and you have the option of picking up what you left at the ticket counter if you really want it. Maybe you don't. Having accomplished just one thing, if nothing else, here is a place to which you can return. You can do dream re-entry, you can do lucid dreaming to return to this place and let much more unfold when you make the time in your life to have an adventure in this kind of active imagination. Fine. <laughs> Robert, we get to wrap this up. This has been so beautiful. But one last thought slash question comes to mind, and I think this is from your daughter, if I have that right, who would punch a hole in the world or punch a hole in the dream and go right through it to the other side well let me let me tell it to you as she told it to me she sighs deeply when she hears me telling the story after all these years she was four at the time and she said to me one day and to every parent everyone who has access to, to kids this is really so cool it's also cool in dealing with the inner child the magical child in our own being Children, when it hasn't been crushed out of them, are so wise about dreaming. As adults, we must listen up. And here's an example of why that's so important. So Sophie, age four, says, Daddy, you know I go to this special place. Yes. Do you know how I go there? Oh, you use that doogie doogie thing, because you have this little African thing, this little drum thing with corks. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's incidental. She used words like this from very young. In, that's incidental. You want to hear how I really go there? Yes. Oh, well, sometimes I take the sun gate. Sometimes I take the moon gate. Sometimes I take the tree gate. Sometimes I take the rainbow bridge. And sometimes I punch a hole in the world. That was the spontaneous shamanism of the child. Sometimes I punch a hole in the world. So the first chapter of my book, Active Dreaming, and I think I pick it up again in Growing Big Dreams, is titled punch a hole in the world, because that was the fundamental wisdom uh, restored to me, renewed in me, through the wisdom of a four-year-old child. Listen to your kids. Want to get good at this? Listen to your and support them. And never, ever, ever say to a child, it's only a dream. That is the stupidest thing, the dumbest thing that adults ever do. Brilliant. The first part, Woohoo! The second part, listen to what Robert says. This has been brilliant. And, and what a brilliant shaman you brought forth into the world this lifetime. Well, it's great when this can run in families, isn't it? It really is great. I love to see families doing this together. And I love to see families inheriting her together. I'm very loose about the idea that it runs in families in the lineage sense, but sometimes it does. I mean, I have sat in Lithuania with families where the knowledge is passed from grandmother to granddaughter as they pick mushrooms in due season, the knowledge of the old ways, the knowledge of the dreaming of the Baltic, the knowledge of Shamina, the earth goddess of the Baltic, is passed grandmother to granddaughter as they bend to pick mushrooms in the woods. This is a beautiful thing. Not, not all of us are privileged to have families in which 
these traditions run like that. But when we do, it's wonderful. Very cool. So we've got to wrap things up here. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get growing big dreams, get many copies of this, give them all out, and begin growing big dreams in your waking life and dream life too. Today and above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woohoo! Row, row, row your boat gently down the road. <laughs> row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. I hope you enjoyed this amazing interview with Robert Moss as much as I did and really start to take this seriously and dive into your dream work. So powerful, so important, and incredibly life transformative. On that note, Another key tool to help you to transform your life is to pick up AWE, the automatic writing experience, where you can take your dreams, put them down on paper, and let the universe unravel and interpret them for you. So certainly, automatic writing helps you channel, helps you communicate with the other side, but helps you with dream interpretation and connecting with loved ones on the other side in your dreams as well. You can get it at any of your local booksellers. You can get it at amazon.com. You can get the entire video-based program along with live classes at automaticwriting.com. Now, if you like what I have to share on the shows, come join us for our live events every Monday night. Simply click the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified of upcoming live shows with me on Monday nights, YouTube premieres, and more. There's also a join link below. That's for our mystic circle. So we have a school of mystics, which meets four Wednesdays a month where I'm teaching people how to become the mystic you were always meant to be. That's at inspirenationuniversity.com. Learn how to become a mystic but you can click that join button down below, join the mystic circle and get lots of behind the scenes, goodness, tips, techniques, cameo appearances, roo-roo appearances, kitty cat appearances, and more. Lots of good fun stuff. Just simply click that join link below. Here's a link to the next show. Big thumbs up if you like this. Leave your comments below. Love you guys so, so much. Shine bright. Woohoo! And get to dreaming. Love you guys.